I'm uh, going to presenting uh, experimental results related to a <clears throat> couple of talks which we had today concerning uh, models uh, of uh, spontaneous collapse of the wave function. So the, the title, uh, as you read, uh, uh, is about uh, experiments in the cosmic silence. So we mean by cosmic silence, this amazing lab where we are hosted. Uh, in particular, we have two experiments. One is ongoing here and another uh, in, uh, in this uh, sector of the lab. So wh what is it? This is uh, an amazing and quite unique environment uh, uh, in central Italy where the overburden, which is provided by hundreds of meters of granite rock, reduces uh, the flux uh, of cosmic rays at uh, a very, very high level. For example, the flux of muons is re reduced of six orders of magnitude uh, at the, at the um, ground and uh, the flux of neutrons of about three orders of magnitude. So at the end, uh, the background which we, which, uh, we, we remain to be faced with is uh, essentially consisting of uh, gamma radiation from long-lived gamma emitting primordial isotopes and uh, the decay products, plus the radon, which is present in the environment uh, of these under mountain cavities. So uh, we heard a lot today about the models of wave function collapse, so I will not deepen on the theory. So just to briefly summarize the idea, you heard that the, the macro objectification problem is not only a philosophical problem, it's a mathematical problem, it's in, an inconsistency among the basic pillars of quantum mechanics. But nowadays, uh, it also has a very, very strong and hot impact on the emerging quantum technologies, because at the end, the questions which were put forward uh, theoretically today can also be uh, translated in the other question. If, if we imagine uh, even to perfectly isolate the quantum system, you know, what uh, people is trying to do in, uh, in quantum uh, technologies, uh, regardless uh, its size will, uh, the, the unitary and uh, linear uh, evolution of this state uh, be forever. So uh, the, the question, the, the answer of, uh, of uh, the theoreticians working in this field is no, because when you uh, pack together more and more mass, at some point the superposition principle should break down. And as you heard, the big debate uh, nowadays is uh, what's the physical field which should trigger the spontaneous, in this sense, this dynamical uh, collapse of the wave function. Now, obviously, uh, up to me at least, one of the most fascinating ones uh, is uh, the one which is related to gravity. So the, the gravity triggering uh, the collapse. And this idea dates back to Feynman in his mm -hmm. lectures on gravitation. He already proposed the fact that since we see that the collapse somehow should be related uh, with the amount of mass, maybe uh, gravity should not be quantized, then this is somehow the original idea uh, of Dioshi together with Lukács. We are speaking about uh, an original paper of 1987 in which they uh, perform a Gedanken experiment showing that uh, quantum theory should require an absolute indeterminacy of the gravitational field meaning that uh, uh, the local gravitational potential uh, should be uh, regarded as a stochastic variable, which means that what we measure, what we deal with the Newtonian potential is the mean of this stochastic variable, which has a correlation function, which in the original formulation of the theory is inversely proportional to the uh, volume of the space-time cell, and so is, uh, is white uh, in time, as you can see. Uh, okay, as you heard this morning from Sandro and also this afternoon from, uh, from Angelo, then Penrose arrives uh, more or less to the same predictions in, in terms of the time of the decay of the quantum collapse by uh, imagining something that can be uh, very simply stated, like when you have a special superposition of, uh, of a quantum state, you will end up also with uh, a superposition of two branches of the space-time, and this is unstable and decays uh, uh, in a time which is as short as much as the amount of matter which is involved in the superposition. So both Dioshi and Penrose independently end up with uh, the same prediction for the collapse time of the superposition, which is inversely proportional 
to this gravitational self energy uh, of the difference among the two states in the superposition. And as you heard this morning, this is already very effective in collapsing, for example, a dust grain. No? As you can see, while obviously it preserves the quantum dynamics for a quantum object like proton. Now, originally, uh, the, the theory is basically parameter free. So you have a coupling constant, which is the, the big G. But at the end, uh, a parameter is to be introduced. So the, they are forced to introduce a parameter because this uh, self-gravitational energy diverges for point side particles, which means that uh, they should be collapsed in instantaneously, which obviously is absurd. So the, the way uh, the ocean perros come out from this problem is introducing uh, a parameter, which is the important quantity for uh, our experimentalists, because it's exactly the quantity which we try to measure. The way they do is, is also different. The Oshi, for example, uh, uh, takes R0 like a free parameter of the model, uh, uh, a limit on the spatial resolution of the mass density, while Penrose tries to do something uh, a bit uh, uh, more involved mathematically. So he uh, thinks that R0 is the size of the particle mass density, uh, taken as a solution of the stationary uh, Schrodinger-Newton equation. But at the end, doesn't matter what the interpretation of the R0, the main point uh, from, uh, from the observational point of view is that uh, the bigger R0, uh, R0 will enter in the self-gravitational energy and the bigger R0, the larger is the collapse time and the fainter will be the radiation. Which radiation? So as you heard by Angelo, uh, obviously there is huge work ongoing experimentally to test directly collapse models. For example, by creating large superposition of masses system uh, is necessarily as big as possible in order to warrant that the, the decay time, so the survival by the spontaneous collapse of this system is effective before environmental decoherence destroys. The experiment, but unfortunately, these kind of direct tests are still far to be sensitive in order to put strong constraints on the parameter of the collapse models in general. I will also show you something about the continuous spontaneous localization. So what we do uh, instead is to use an unavoidable side effect of the collapse, namely what uh, is called spontaneous radiation. So to give you pictorically an idea, which is very simple of how this process works, when the quantum state interacts with the stochastic field, which is responsible for the collapse, which can be uh, the white unknown field of the continuous continuous localization or the stochastic fluctuation of the gravitational potential in the case of the DP, it undergoes a, a Brownian diffusion, no, simply. Uh, now, if this is a charged particle, it's accelerated and it will emit radiation. Very faint, but it will emit. From the uh, point of view of the unavoidability of this side effect, uh, we heard this morning very uh, general statements, very general result, which was recently defined by Sandro and Angelo. Uh, let's say that from a mathematical point of view, uh, what we have to have in mind is that the collapse probability in general uh, in the spontaneous models of collapse is Poissonian in time. And this means that uh, the dynamics uh, becomes limbled, uh, which means that we will have uh, uh, for a free, free particle uh, an increase in time of the average square momentum. So we will have diffusion. So what we do experimentally, we put ourselves in this extremely clean environment in the Grand Sasso National Laboratory, and we observe with the cleanest possible detector, germanium detector, you will see uh, the spontaneous emission from the atoms of the detector itself, which is active, and in general, from all the material which surrounds this detector. So the strategy is to try to describe at the maximum possible level all the known emission processes which are involved in the setup that you characterize and you know very well, and then to try to perform some statistical Bayesian in particular, in our case, comparison among what you measure what you know from the background, from your simulations, and what is the theoretical expectation. Now, what's the theoretical expectation? The theoretical expectation comes from the dynamics, which uh, was shown this morning, 
with the calculation of the expected spectrum, the, the rate of this uh, spontaneous photon emission by the material at your disposal. Now here, I want to point uh, a fundamental uh, point, which will be the center of the second part of my talk, that as you can see, these rates I show here, both for the gravity related and also for the continuous spontaneous localization models is very simple in its structure. Uh, it depends on the energy, like one over E, so you expect more radiation at lower energies, and it depends on the typical parameters uh, of the model. For the DP, just one phenomenological parameter, this correlation length, this cutoff, R0, capital R0. In the CSL, there are two, again, a correlation length and a strength, okay? But this simple expression, which was worked out by Bassi and Donadi in the last years, is straightly valid just in an energy domain. Uh, to be safe, I put 0.5 MeV, you will understand. So let's see that we are in the domain of the gamma rays, okay? So what's the experimental setup? We go there, you saw amazing pictures of this uh, laboratory where we are performing our measurements. So I, I go in the more boring uh, technical part. So this is the crystal, the germanium crystal, which we use to perform the measurement is about two kilograms of a coaxial P-type high purity germanium detector, which is surrounded by a very complex uh, uh, system of layers of shielding, electrolytic copper inside, purity lead outside, and then also a thick uh, layer of borated polyethylene, which is a very good neutron absorber for what remains, survives from the cosmics. And then everything is enclosed. Ah, obviously, uh, we, we operate everything at cryogenic temperatures also to reduce the thermal uh, noise. And then everything uh, is enclosed in uh, an airtight uh, steel housing, which is continuously flushed with boiled of nitrogen uh, simply to reduce uh, the, the other component of the ground under mountain which is the radon gas. So at the end, up, uh, you end up, uh, this is about three months of data taking uh, in two years uh, with the black spectrum. In the energy domain, again, I underline in between one MeV and four MeV. And then what you start trying to do is to describe all the background which comes from the known processes. Known means that previous, use of the measurement, we measure the activities of each piece of our detector and we put everything in what is called a validated uh, simulation. Validation means that we undergo uh, constantly some campaigns no, to understand the sensitivity of the description of our detector. You put everything in this simulation and you simulate uh, the, the decays of each radionuclide in each material of your detector, all the decay schemes, the propagation of all the daughter photons and everything. Uh, uh, in your detector, and we ended up with this uh, green distribution, which as you can see, is in very good agreement uh, with the measurement, which describes about 90% of the measurement. Then the other ingredient uh, is the theoretical expectation. So I showed you what's the theoretical rate. You convolute this rate by the efficiency, the acceptance of your detector, this function here, that again you obtain by Monte Carlo simulation, and you end up uh, with the shape, uh, uh, with the expected shape of your signal. So at the end, you put uh, your spectrum, your expected background, uh, your uh, theoretically expected signal into your uh, uh, Bayesian, in this case, statistical model. And the aim of the analysis is to extract the posterior probability density function of the physical parameters, those correlation function and rate of the collapse uh, of the collapse models. So concerning, I give you here the example of the gravity related model, we end up, by that obviously you can put upper limits since we don't evidence any significative signal of, spon of collapse, of spontaneous collapse. Nevertheless, you can put strong limits on the parameters of the model. So strong that uh, we can uh, bound uh, R0, for example, the correlation length of the gravity related model uh, up to half an Armstrong. Please put the attention of the, of the um, size of this parameter, which you have to compare with the theoretical expectation. 
Now, for example, if you take Penrose interpretation, again, R0 is interpreted as the size of the nucleus wave function. And if you calculate this for the, uh, for the case of our experiment, so for uh, you calculate the mean square displacement of the nucleus in the germanium lattice cooled down at liquid nitrogen temperature, you find out that R0 should be of the order of uh, 0.5 Armstrongs. So one order of magnitude less. So by this, we succeeded to rule out significantly the Yoshi Penrose in its original formulation. And as you heard by, by Angelo, for example, what the theoreticians, our friends are now trying to do is to uh, design new, more involved models, probably with the introduction of new free parameters uh, in order to counteract this uh, uh, excessive uh, amount of radiation. The two, two immediate ways uh, which uh, we can imagine to do this is, for example, to add dissipation terms to the uh, master equation uh, to counteract this uh, energy uh, increase and to design uh, non-white, non-Markovian models. So uh, let me uh, comment a second. Uh, as I showed you at the very beginning, the correlation function uh, for the stochastic fluctuation of the gravitational field originally taken by Dio, she is white in time. No? So the, the, the other step immediate that one can do is to complicate this assumption and going to colored non-Markovian models. Now, the, the point of uh, which will be the argument of the second part of my talk, it's that uh, this is very nice, uh, but this puts extreme challenges now for the uh, forthcoming uh, experimental measurements of the spontaneous radiation as an observable for the collapse. And this depends on the fact that uh, a non-Markovian, for example, uh, collapse model implies a dramatic dependence of the spontaneous photons emission spectrum, which depends on the interplay in between the wavelength of the spontaneous photon and the atomic structure, the germanium atomic structure, for example, in our experiment. Let me just mention, without entering in the details, that by performing a, a completely analogous analysis, we also set a very strong bound on the parameters of the continuous-continuous localization. So now, uh, as I said, we, we move, for example, to a color, to a non-Markovian model. Non-Markovianity implies that in the theory there will be a further parameter, which will be a cutoff frequency. Cutoff frequency means that the interesting energies that you have to check are lower and lower, no? as much as uh, you bound on uh, the cutoff of, of your model. This is exactly what we already started to do. And we already performed the measurement with an upgraded setup. Essentially, the, the detection is the same and the upgrade uh, was to install a further layer uh, made of uh, three cylindrical sections of extreme radio purity Roman lead uh, immediately around uh, the, the germanium crystal. Um, okay, you can find uh, if you are curious all the details of the setup here, so I, I don't enter in the details. Just to, uh, to tell you what was the goal, obviously, was to go to lower energy. So from the domain of the gamma rays, uh, we want now to investigate, uh, to be safe, and in a few slides you will understand what I mean, the energy domain in between uh, 65 and 90 keV. Okay, so we went to the domain of the X rays to be compatible uh, with some cutoff, which will be introduced by the non-wide generalization of the models. Okay, now uh, this, this is the spectrum which, which we measure. Now consider that uh, given the energy resolution of the detector at this energy, which is about half a keV, and the detailed study of all the materials which were involved, as I told you, we measured everything previous to perform the measurement, uh, you can just expect in this energy window to observe eventually some signal from the K-complex co K uh, uh, of atomic transitions of, of lead. Uh, you see that we succeeded to take such a clean measurements that you cannot even recognize uh, the key alpha. So here I superimpose with arbitrary normalization with the, the, what you expect. No? This is the key alpha one, two, and the key beta complex. 
So you don't see anything. So we measured an extremely clean spectrum, which uh, is just flat the ground, essentially. So we succeeded to totally suppress uh, how is this uh, could uh, be created by the branch stralung, essentially. So surviving photons from the outer parts of the shielding, which somehow propagate. So we killed uh, all of them. How much time I still have, sorry. We still have the 20. 20 minutes, okay. And uh, so the strategy now will be to disentangle, again, by means of uh, a Bayesian analysis, the shape of the expected spontaneous emission uh, radiation uh, from this flat background, uh, accounting uh, for the typical cancellation effects, which will be involved uh, in the theoretical uh, uh, shape uh, by the uh, non Markovian assumption. The uh, analysis model is, uh, is very simple. So, uh, what, again, what you want to end up uh, is the, the posterior uh, probability distribution function of whatever general parameter of your uh, collapse model given, uh, given your data. And this you do by integrating away all the background degrees of freedom uh, of, of your uh, experimental apparatus. Where the shape enters is simply into the likelihood, because you can parameterize the likelihood, for example, by factorizing products of uh, Poissonian distributions, and in the expectation value of your number of counts in the bin, obviously it enters the shape both of the background and of the signal. And the shape of the signal uh, is given by the theory. So here you recognize the theoretical parameter, some constant which is typical of the collapse model under consideration, the CSL or the DP. Uh, an alpha parameter, which I will show you now, which will manifest this much more complex dependence on the energy of the spontaneous radiation uh, in relation with the atomic structure, and all of these obviously convoluted by your experiment, by your efficiency and acceptance. Okay, so uh, let me go to face then this, uh, this final message that I wanted to tell. What's the future of the spontaneous radiation as an observable uh, for, uh, for the collapse? Uh, the good news is that the interest of the scientific community in this field uh, is, uh, is huge now. For example, a few weeks ago, Majorana Demonstrator uh, just published a PRL on the subject, and they, for example, analyzed their spectrum in the range in between 15 keV and 40-something keV, where they have an excellent uh, uh, description of the background. This, again, the message, very good. This is exactly what we have to do because non Markovianity means uh, let's move to lower energy because we will have some cutoff in the theory. But the warning is that uh, by analyzing the spectrum exactly with the same expectation theoretical from the rate which we used, so by performing the same analysis, they got a very strong limit, indeed, more than two orders of magnitude better, for example, for the CSL than us. But the message is, the, is that we have to be extremely careful because when we move from the domain of the gamma rays to the domain of the X rays, something happens in the theory, which is, which I call cancellation, which is this complex interplay among the energy of the photon and the atomic structure. So before coming uh, to the equation, uh, let me uh, tell you in words because the idea is very simple. So we move to low energy. To low energy means that the wavelength, the, the Broglie wavelength of the photon, which you are measuring, the spontaneous photon, will start to become of the same order of the dimension of the atomic orbits, okay? For example, in the case of Majorana, if you take a 15 keV uh, spontaneous photon, this uh, has a wavelength of about one Armstrong, okay? And one Armstrong for the germanium atom that they also use to extract their limit is, is here, is two thirds of the atomic structure, okay? Now what happens if the wavelength of the photon is bigger than the distance among the emitters, the charged particles, in particular, if it's bigger than the distance among the proton, uh, they are all packed together in a point-like object for what concerns us, and an electron, no? and if contemporary, the correlation length of your theory, the famous R0 or Rc, is also bigger than the distance in between the emitters, then each pair of opposite charge emitter will cancel. 
in formulas. So this is the simple rate which I showed you before, no? which is valid in the gamma domain. Now, if you go to low energies, you have to take into account for the complete, uh, for, the, for the general expression of the rate, which has this phase here. Now, let me use the CSL because it's simpler. And it's simpler for a simple reason, that the correlation length of the CSL, as you can see from this map, is constrained already to be bigger than 10 to the minus eight meters. So it's much bigger than the atomic dimension, okay? So this means that uh, the stochastic field of the CSL vibrates together all the particles of the atom, okay? Now, let's come to the interplay in between the particle distances and the wavelength of the photon. This is contained in these B terms here. So you see that if the wavelength is much, much smaller than the atomic dimension, in the case of the gamma rays before, you end up with this enormous simplification of your formula. But if instead the wavelength of the photon is of the same order of the atomic dimension or the or of the orbits, you have to take into account for this complete structure, which contains the coherent emission from the protons in the nucleus, the coherent emission from the electrons, and the coupled emission of electrons and nucleons and this is exactly the responsible for the cancellation. Just to give you an immediate example, if you take the limit in which the photon covers the whole atom or more, then all these terms go to one, and this bracket will end up in a perfect square, which for a neutral matter means zero. So in this case, you don't expect spontaneous radiation at all, okay? Obviously, the case of Majorana and our case, this is the reason why we moved a bit farther, a bit to higher energy, is intermediate. And the analysis that you have to uh, perform is much more complicated with respect to before, because apart from the beta uh, constant, which I showed you before, which is the same, you don't have any more than a squared number of protons. You have such a complex expression which involves the photon energy with respect to the dimension of the orbits, okay? Now for the DP, I still have no, a few minutes. I took the example of the CSL because it's simpler. The DP is even more complicated because in the case of the DP, you have to consider both the interplay among the distances of the emitters with the uh, wavelength of the, of the photon, but also the interplay of their distances with the correlation length of the model, this famous R0. So let me stress again, because this is very important, there is no cancellation. So there is no problem if the correlation length is much smaller than the distance among the emitters. But unfortunately, we brought R0 in the domain of the atomic structure because our uh, previous limit, which I showed you, is half an Armstrong. So again, we are exactly there. Now, the formal expression, general expression for the rate in the case of the gravity-related model is very similar to the previous one. In particular, the dependence uh, on the interplay with the wavelength of the photon is the same, while it's a bit more involved to understand what's the relation in between the distances uh, of the particles and the correlation length. Let me show you uh, just to, <clears throat> to give you, uh, to explain you why we have to move to, to, to lower energies. Uh, if you in particular redo the same calculation uh, with a colored, a non-Markovian correlation function. Here, for example, I take an exponential one, but you can also take a Gaussian. Uh, it depends on, on your choice. But in any case, we'll have some cutoff frequency here, which enters in your expected rate in this way. So as you see, this kills at some point the spontaneous radiation above your cutoff frequency. So you are forced to go to low energies. Okay, I'm concluding just a couple of slides. Uh, uh, as I told you, here is a bit more complicated to understand how the particle distances interplay with the correlation length, but everything uh, is hidden in this Fij, which have this structure. Now, if you integrate by parts and you recognize that this is nothing but the gravitational force on the unit mass given uh, by this mass density here, 
and you again integrate by parts and you use Poisson, you end up with a very nice expression. So you find that these Fij terms, which enter in, in, in your rate here, uh, are nothing but a measure of the superpositions in somehow of, of the mass densities. So the message is that uh, uh, if uh, your emitters, for example, uh, two electrons or the proton and the electron are here uh, with a distance which is much bigger than the correlation length, no? and uh, the, these two Gaussians, these two mass distribution are very narrow with respect to are not, you, you will have a negligible contribution. But instead, if the contrary happens, and this is the regime which, in which we are now experimentally, because as I told you, R0 is of the order of the Armstrong, then you can show that this Fij reduced to this constant. And if the wavelength of the photon covers the distance among the protons and the electrons, you will end up with the same cancellation, which I showed you before for the CSL. Okay, so on this subject, we are presently finalizing uh, uh, a draft and we will submit it soon. Uh, that somehow I think will serve uh, as a guide for, uh, for the next experiments, which would like uh, to investigate spontaneous radiation in uh, the, the regime, which will be uh, important for the future models. So I conclude very briefly this morning, Catalina showed you this curiosity uh, based on the uh, limit which we put on the correlation length of the gravity related model. We wanted to tell something about this fascinating model of consciousness, consciousness which is based uh, on uh, quantum processes, on uh, coherence uh, and, uh, and entanglement uh, in, the, in the brain, not only the human brain in general. Uh, it's very fascinating. It also have a uh, very interesting uh, evolutionary interpretation, this model. But, okay, unfortunately, but still uh, uh, concerning uh, the more fundamental gravity-related model, which we analyzed, uh, the one, the white, uh, non-Markovian and non-dissipative, uh, we put a very, very strong bound uh, indeed uh, on the number of neurons which should be coherent uh, for, a for the time necessary for the consciousness uh, to emerge from this kind of process. This is as big as 10 to the 17, uh, but the, our brain uh, contains just 10 to 11 neurons. So it's quite implausible. But again, the message is that now we will have novel models, much more complex, and we also have in our hands a novel way to interpret the data. So uh, now it will be very interesting to see also this kind of quantum related consciousness model will, uh, will react, will be probably retaking the play no? by, by our uh, new knowledges. Thank you.